Let me start with another provocative parable of Zhuangzi, my favorite philosopher of the 4th century BCE. There once were three emperors who were good friends. One ruled the Southern Sea, another the Northern Sea, and another the Middle Kingdom. The emperors from the North and the South occasionally gathered in the Middle Kingdom to have fellowship and fun. Interestingly, the emperor of the Middle Kingdom did not have the seven holes in his head like other humans, meaning he didn't have eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. I think he must look like an egghead. As the host, however, he always provided excellent hospitality to his two friends from the north and south. One day, the two emperors from the north and south said, let's do something for our kind host to express our gratitude for his hospitality. Since he has no holes in his face, let's bore some holes so he will have eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. He will appreciate our gift when he can see, smell, taste, and hear. So they bore a hole in him each day. He got an eye on the first day, another eye on the second day, a nostril on the third day, and so on. After the seventh day, they finished their project, but to their surprise, he died. End of the story. Do you understand this provocative parable? One of the most famous fables for 2,400 years. What does it mean? The story sounds funny and ridiculous, but the meaning is profound. It means what we see, hear, smell, and taste can kill us. Our senses allow us to differentiate, discern, and discriminate between good and evil. For example, when we can see, we discriminate between beauty and ugliness. When we can smell, we discriminate between fragrance and stench. When we can hear, we discriminate between pleasant and unpleasant sounds. When we can taste, we discriminate between sweetness and bitterness. Our five senses give us the duality of good and evil. That duality is the source of anxiety that destroys our happiness. The two emperors thought it was an excellent gift for their egghead friend, but it ended up killing him. If you are still confused, let me explain. This parable is a dramatic depiction of the fall of humans. It is like eating the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The emperor from the Middle Kingdom was like Adam and Eve, living an innocent carefree, and abundant life in the beautiful garden of God's love. Like the serpent, the two well-meaning friends opened their friends' senses to acquire the knowledge of good and evil, but it was a gift of death. As God says to Adam and Eve in the garden, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Genesis 2.17 You know the story. Adam and Eve ate the fruit, but they didn't die, not immediately. Instead, their first anxiety of shame kicked in. The Bible says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Genesis 3.7 have you ever wondered why it says, then the eyes of both were open, as if their eyes were not open previously? Adam and Eve apparently had eyes, and that's how they could see the fruit. But now their eyes were opened to the duality of good and evil. Seeing shame and decency was their first experience. Nakedness was their first anxiety to live with passing down to generations to generation to this day. Have you ever had a dream where you were in public naked? It was a terrible nightmare, isn't it? What an anxiety. It reveals that human anxiety comes from the duality of good and evil. What's wrong with duality, you might ask? Don't we all want to know what is good and evil so we can choose good? 
The truth is, duality not only makes us discriminate between good and evil, but also makes us compare between good, better, and best. As a result, we desire to keep up with the Joneses, consciously or unconsciously, since we know what is better or worse. Since then, everyone has a different level of sense of good and evil. Arguments and fights erupt between friends. All the bickerings in life involves, I am good and you are evil. Wars break out between countries, with each side thinking they are fighting against evil. Our national elections evolve a lot of debates between good and evil. News media feed people's anxiety with good and evil. At a dinner party not long ago, I sat next to a friend who is a high school teacher in New York City. I asked him about his teaching career. He said the kids nowadays seem to have a great deal of anxiety and some mental issues. They seem to be more fragile than the previous generations. The abundance of toys, technology, and social media has given them the anxiety to compare, compete, and catch up relentlessly. Later, I discovered that the high anxiety problem is not just with children, but also with adults. As Dr. Erwin Freeman said, we live in an anxious society. He said it over 30 years ago, but it's worsening as time goes on. Why? As our world becomes more and more complex, our burden to differentiate between good and evil, decency and shame, and success and failure become heavier than ever. Now we have more reasons to feel like a failure in these complicated times. No wonder our anxiety is higher than ever, covertly or overtly. Some anxieties are covert. Some people don't even know they have anxiety until symptoms show up physically, emotionally, or relationally. I call it covert anxiety. Covert anxiety is worse than overt anxiety because it's eating people from the inside without them realizing it. So you can trace any problem of yourself or of the world to the duality of good and evil. The question is, how do you stop seeing duality? How do you undo the knowledge of good and evil? How do you unsee what you see? How do you uneat that forbidden fruit? How do you return to the carefree life of living in the Garden of Eden? The good news is God knows our plight, and that's why he sent Jesus to end human anxiety for good by redeeming us from the suffering in the duality and restoring us to the state of oneness called the kingdom of God, which is another term for the Garden of Eden. So today we'll look at how Jesus shows us the path to end anxiety by paving our way to the kingdom of God based on this week's scripture lesson. Hi, in case we haven't met yet, I'm Sam Stone, the Light Keeper. You are the light of the world. I'm the keeper. No pun intended. It's my calling to help you shine your brightest so that God is glorified in you and you are satisfied in God. The scripture lesson for today, the third Sunday after Epiphany, is from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Listen to the word of the Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and that they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. Mark 1, 14-20 Blessed are those who delight in God's word. Thanks be to God. 
The story begins in times of high anxiety when John the Baptist was arrested for proclaiming the kingdom of God and baptizing people for repentance. He offended King Herod by pointing out his sin of adultery. Shame could turn people in power into tyrants. Risking a similar fate, Jesus launched his mission at this time. The Bible says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Mark 1, 14 to 15. Here, Jesus proclaimed the same message as John the Baptist did. Why did Jesus risk his life to deliver the same message that caused his cousin to be arrested? Is it because he had compassion for humanity and wants to end our suffering of anxiety? Matthew said, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 9.36 When anxiety strikes, don't you feel like a sheep without a shepherd? Jesus launched his mission despite these unfavorable times because his overwhelming compassion tells him, you are worth dying for. After all, this is the good news, the good news of redemption and restoration, of freedom from anxiety. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Verse 15, it's good news because the kingdom of God is the garden of God's love. It's the end of human anxiety. The question is, what is the kingdom of God? People have been asking this question for thousands of years. In short, it's a metaphor for a state or a lifestyle under God's sovereignty that extends from now to eternity. If anxiety comes from the duality of good and evil, the kingdom of God is oneness, non-duality. In the kingdom of God, we are one with God and with one another. Oneness ends anxiety because there's nothing to compare or contrast. There's nothing to differentiate and discriminate because everything is one. Jesus described it in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed to the Father, As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. John 17, 21 and 23. Oneness is the kingdom of God. Duality is the kingdom of humans or fallen humans. Next time when you feel anxious, think about who you are comparing in your mind or what good or evil you are trying to achieve or avoid. Then you will notice you live in duality. Enter the oneness of the kingdom of God, and you will find nothing to compare to, and the anxiety will go away. Let go of duality and let God of oneness. Now, how do you practice oneness? Jesus' teaching of oneness is also in the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 37 to 39. What does it mean to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength? It means oneness with God. The second part is not so apparent because we often misunderstood it as love your neighbor as you love yourself. If we interpret that way, we are in a duality mode. Because there is you and me. I love me and I love you as I love myself. That's wrong interpretation. What Jesus means is, I love you as you are part of me. I love you as if you are part of myself. That's the correct understanding. That's oneness because in this interpretation, you are myself. The word love here is translated from Greek agape. The Greeks have many words for love. Each has its specific meaning. Scholars throughout history have tried to interpret agape, and most of them define it as sacrificial love, as exemplified by Jesus on the cross. But when we put it in the context of Jesus' own teaching, 
it means oneness love or harmonious love. You do need to sacrifice your ego to live in harmony with others, to live in oneness with God and everyone. Now you know what the kingdom of God is, oneness with God and people. Then what do you need to do to enter the kingdom of God? Jesus wants you to repent. The word repent is translated from Greek, metaneo, meaning to change one's mind. So to repent is to change your mind. In this case, to change your mind from duality mindset to oneness mindset. There's no good and evil in the kingdom of God. Everything is good, as God said after the creation. Even suffering is good. Just think about it. I feel such in suffering to pay my mortgage, but millions of people around the world suffer to bring their next meal to the table. If I'm in oneness with them, how dare I complain about my life since they are part of myself? So repent from complaining, comparing, and contrasting. We all are one. Oneness ends anxiety. There's no loser in oneness. Everyone is a winner. It was such a freedom when I discovered the oneness of the kingdom of God. But I keep regressing to duality because we live in the fallen world of duality. So I need to repent over and over again until I enter the eternal kingdom when I die. But my oneness mentality grows each time I repent. My anxiety becomes weaker and weaker. I've discovered a way to stay more constantly in oneness. The rest of the passage shows Jesus recruiting the first four disciples, two pairs of two brothers. Simon and Andrew fished from the shore, meaning they were poor. James and John fished on the boats, indicating they were rich. Jesus called both poor and rich to follow him. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Verse 17. The correct translation of this verse is, I will make you become fishers of people. Since Jesus was talking with the fisherman, he used a fishing metaphor for bringing people into the kingdom. But we should not mistakenly think he's teaching us to bait and switch. In his three years of teaching the disciples, he never taught his disciples to trick people into believing. Jesus brings people into the kingdom by teaching. Of course, he performs some healing and miracles, but all of them are for teaching. His great commission reveals how he wants us to fish. He said, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. That's the key verse. The best way to learn is to teach. He promised to be with us when we do that. We experience oneness with Christ when we teach. Again, oneness eliminates anxiety. We don't have to worry about how many fish we get or whether we get any fish at all. Our job is to teach, sow the seeds, water the plants, and nurture the crops. When the fruits are ripe, we bring in the harvest. That's our kingdom lifestyle. As Paul said, in him we live, move, and have our being. Acts 17, 28. That's oneness living. That's the kingdom of God. That's the end of anxiety. Let's live it and teach it. That's it for today. I hope you find this message illuminating as much as I enjoy receiving it from the head office. Until we meet again, keep your light shining brighter and broader and harvest the fruit of profound freedom, purpose, and happiness. Amen. Bye now.